Hello Booktube, and welcome to your Daily Penguin. This is our waddle through my Penguin Classic wall, uh, and we are going book by book, and author by author, and period by period. We did the ancient world, we did the classical world, Greece and Rome. Uh, and we're now moving into what has colloquially been referred to as the Dark Ages, uh, and there are bright lights shining in the Dark Ages, <laughs> and one of them, one of the first ones that I want to mention, the one I want to talk to you today is in two Penguin Classics, and uh, he's an old friend. He's uh, a couple of centuries after this, this book was written in AD 731, so it's, we're, we're a long way from uh, Horace and Catullus. <laughs> uh, and this is the Venerable Bede. The Penguin Classic, the Ecclesiastical History of the English People, does not uh, call him the Venerable, but nevertheless that has been his sobriquet forever, uh, even in his own lifetime. Uh, he was a monk who decided to write a history of uh, the Anglo-Saxon world of England from the invasion of Julius Caesar all the way through what he viewed as the, the steady, triumphant march of Christianity, gaining a toehold and then gradually converting and expanding all throughout the kingdom. And uh, it's a wonderful book. Bede is a wonderful uh, companion on the page. Uh, and Penguin Classic does this. They do, this is, I think, an update. This is uh, translated by Leo Shirley Price. Uh, and I think it's an update on an earlier translation uh, that, that Penguin did. And the Penguin also does this, The Age of Bede. Uh, and this also, I believe, has, has been updated in more recent years. This is, is tra translated by J.F. Webb and H. D. H. Farmer. Uh, this is the Ecclesiastical History of the English People. This is Bede's masterwork that he wrote forever and ever and worked on for a long time, passed around in segments and samistat form. But he was also a, a well-known author, publishing on all sorts of other subjects as well in his day. And uh, The Age of Bede has two of his works, The Life of Cuthbert and The Lives of the Abbots of Wearmouth and Jarrow. Uh, but it also has a couple of other works. What else is in here? Uh, Eddie Stephanus writing The Life of Wilfred, uh, and the uh, a segment of the Voyage of St. Brendan is in the Age of Bede, and then this is Bede's masterpiece. So you can see already, you can anticipate what one of my wishes would be for Penguin, which would be a complete Bede, uh, a big fat volume that is called The Venerable Bede, and that has all of his writings, but because even including uh, The Lives of the Monks and The Life of Cuthbert, plus this, there's stuff that isn't in either one of those books, that it has no popular edition, therefore. Uh, but Bede doesn't just write about uh, saints' lives and holy moments and uh, great bishops and abbots and whatnot. He also has an amazing eye for real life, for people, their motivations, uh, even the rudiments of drama. Uh, he was a true historian, in other words. He wasn't an ideologue. He wasn't bumping, uh, thumping a pulpit about his religious faith or anybody else's. He was, he was uh, whether he knew it or not, a true historian, someone who noticed people and what they do and why, and had an, an, uh, an, a wonderful sympathetic ear for the quiet moments in his story. Uh, I want to read you uh, one of those quiet moments in the midst of all of these... Uh, bishops and clerics, just so you get an idea of what I'm talking about, because moments like this occur throughout this book, uh, which I don't know if you'd be able to tell from my tone of voice, but I deeply love this book. Uh, and we haven't had one of those in a while. We haven't had, we've had books that I, that I couldn't live without, but not, not, uh, not like this. This is a friend. Uh, so let me read you a little passage here. It's not, it's not, uh, uniform. It's far more likely that you're going to read about uh, religious houses and whatnot throughout this book. But there are, there are moments like this regularly enough to keep you going, if that's what you need to keep going. Uh, in a village not far distant lived a dumb youth known to the bishop, for he had often visited him to receive alms and had never been able to utter a single word. In addition, he had so many scabs and scales on his head that no hair ever grew on the crown, but only a few wisps stood up in a ragged circle around it. So the bishop ordered this youth to be fetched, and a little hut to be made for him in the enclosure round the house where he could live and receive his daily allowance. When one week of Lent was passed, on the following Sunday, John told the poor lad to come to him, and when he had entered, he ordered him to put out his tongue and show it to him. Then he took him by the chin and, making the sign of the Holy Cross on his tongue, told him to retract it and speak. 
Pronounce some word, he said. Say yea, which is the English word of agreement and assent, i.e. yes. <laughs> the lad's tongue was loosed, and at once he did what he was told. The bishop then proceeded to the, la to the names of the letters. Say A, and he said A. Now say B, and he said, which the youth did. And when he was, had repeated the names of each of the letters after the bishop, the letter added syllables, the latter added syllables and words for him to repeat after him. When he had uttered every single word accordingly, the bishop sent him to repeat longer sentences, and he did so. All those who were present say that all that day and the next night, as long as he could keep awake, the youth never stopped saying something and expressing his own inner thoughts and wishes to others, which he had never been able to do before. He was like a cripple, healed by the apostles Peter and John, who stood up, leaped, and walked, entering the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God, rejoicing in the use of his feet, of which he had been so long deprived. The bishop was delighted at his cure, and directed the physician to undertake the cure of the youth's scabby head. The physician did as he was asked, and with the assistance of the bishop's blessing and prayer, his skin healed, and a vigorous growth of hair appeared. So the youth obtained a clear complexion, readiness of speech, and a beautiful head of hair, whereas he had formerly been deformed, destitute, and dumb. In his joy at this recovery, he declined an offer of the, from the bishop for a permanent place in his household, preferring to return to his own home. Uh, and the reason, aside from the wonderful little details in that, I'm sure you noticed them, uh, the reason that I, that I bring that up as an example of what you might find all throughout this book is that it's not, it's not religious. That's not a miracle story. That someone realizing that this that this is not an animal that this this boy who's been neglected and who who's uh, obvious uh, uh, probably had some sort of skin disorder caused by simple poverty and once he had a place in the household and and could be looked after and well cared for that went away that changed and certainly his speech changed what the boy the boy was probably traumatized in some way and needed care and attention. And once that was given, notice there are no invocations to God, no invocations to Jesus at all. Instead, it's, it's a simple human moment, and those occur throughout this book. They are what originally made me fall in love with it. And then I realized, uh, the more I read it, the more I reread it, uh, that you shouldn't really need those. What Bede's original, his, his original intent was to show a kind of um, strand of righteousness running through very human, very fallible vessels towards a glorious end. Now, regardless of what you think of the concept of that righteousness, and no matter what you think of that end, which was the conversion of England, uh, that story, that narrative of a, a glowing thread of redemption is wonderful to read, especially since there is no chicanery about Bede at all. He's not like some other writers who write on that same theme. He means it, and he's he knows a lot about human nature, as that I would hope that segment showed. But there are lots of other segments like that, uh, and uh, there's nothing really in the Age of Bede, this volume, uh, th that isn't written by Bede that comes up to that level. The rest of it, the the, the other two examples in this book are uh, fairly pedestrian. Bede is not. I, you don't have to spend much time with him to know that he's not a pedestrian writer, that this is not someone who's revered because there was no one else around to revere. Uh, so so that is our penguin for today, an old friend, the Venerable Bede. Uh, I recommend this book. It's a tough sell. <laughs> it's an uphill, an uphill climb for you, for most readers, because it's a type of reading that isn't done anymore in the mainstream press. It's a type of reading that hasn't done forever. History isn't written like this anymore. I don't think Bede would even have said that he was writing history. I think he'd have said that he was writing biblical commentary. Uh, but it's fascinating, endlessly fascinating, just the same. So uh, I do recommend it. <laughs> if, if it. If it interests you at all, I do recommend it. It feels a little strange to be recommending the Venerable Bede, but I do. I hope that you give it a chance. Uh, but that is, our, that is our penguin for today, um, an author I couldn't do without. That's not going to be true for, for a lot of these authors coming up, but... It's true for this one. Uh, so I'm going to wrap this up, uh, but I'll be back. Thank you, BookTube.